tonight's Atslander presentation, Cahokia in the Real World, with Alice Beck Kehoe. Take it away, Alice. Back in the 1980s, I did research in Edinburgh uh, and in archives and discovered how scientific prehistory was set up in Edinburgh in Scotland by a group of reformers who are trying to reform the political scene, make it a meritocracy and, and doing many good things. It's just amazing. And among them, they wanted to establish the history of Scotland instead of the archeology span at the time was all the Roman walls and where the picks, the savage naked blue painted picks had battles with the Romans. And that was the archeology. span And among these reformers said, our forefathers were not savages. Our forefathers had homes and shrines, you know, and so on. And so, Geology was being developed as a science at that time. So we're talking 1840s, 1850s. And Scotland's own uh, great geologist was leading in the uh, development of a scientific geology that was based on stratigraphic profiles stratigraphic excavation and relying on the stratigraphy to give you your uh, series through time. And of course, this was challenging the Bible, but they were keeping that fairly uh, quiet. So out of this development of geology as we know it and paleontology as part of it, uh, those who are interested in archeology span such as Daniel Wilson, use the model of geological stratigraphy, geological paleontological excavation to establish a scientific archeology span of prehistoric um, sites. And I eventually published this in 1998 in a book called Land of Prehistory. So that's the method I use. Unhappily for American archeology span in the 1960s, the very ambitious, tall, charismatic, blonde, blue-eyed, good-looking Lewis Binford uh, created what he himself called a revolution in archeology span and following his professor at University of Michigan, as where Tim Paukatet got his degree uh, years later. Uh, Binford claimed that science has to be statistic. Statistics are it. And, and his professor at University of Michigan taught that statistics will reveal patterns and will reveal significant that the ordinary human eye and brain will be blind to. So rely on statistics to show patterns and, and what is significant. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there's a little book that uh, my son at, at Madison was given on his freshman year first day, How to Lie with Statistics. So this, Charismatic leadership by Binford unfortunately turned American archeology span in a very unscientific uh, path. And I uh, feel I'm fortunate that I and my late husband and friends like the late Robert Hall, very good friends, some of you may know, um, Paul uh, published um, Archaeology of the Soul some years ago, the soul. Um, statistics didn't matter. I'll give you one quick 
example of how erroneous you could get with Benford's variety of archaeology. Back in 2000, a former student, I only had undergrad students, but um, a number went on into archaeology and have made names for themselves. And um, one of them, and I've stayed in contact, one of them is Alex Parker, um, who has uh, just taken the position of director of the Arkansas Archaeological Survey. So Barker in 2000 was um, a postdoc basically. And he was at the Smithsonian. He was looking through the collections from Spyro. And he saw a small broken obsidian blade of green obsidian. And because Alex was my student and he knew that Pachuca green obsidian made Teotihuacan's wealth and power. He immediately recognized it. So the first thing he did, he got permission to have it chemically sourced. Yes, it had come from the quarries at Pachuca outside the basin of Mexico. Then Alex went to James Brown at Northwestern, who had meticulously written up the excavation histories at Spyro. Find to do for Is this little green blade definitely from the pre-contact layers at Spyro? So Jim checked the excavation notes and he said, yes, Alex who was actually excavated professionally in the late 30s and it's definitely securely from pre-European contacts by uh, it seals deposit, no question. So Alex said, um, and Dr. Brown, I have had this chemically sourced and it's from the Pachuca quarry in Mexico. It's Mexican green obsidian. And James Brown said, Alex, it's only one specimen. One instance statistically has no significance. In other words, forget it. So that is an illustration of the wrong path that Benford and his statistics led even a good archeologist like James Brown. Well, uh, Alex Barker was not to be deterred. And I should mention here that my colleague, Donald Blakesley, whom I talk about later, uh, in Kansas has recognized seven pieces of Pachuca green obsidian found by avocational archeologists in central Kansas and the Arkansas River Valley. And Blakesley is perfectly confident in the integrity and the knowledge of these avocational archaeologists. So definitely it was being traded up the Arkansas River, uh, at least to Spyro. So there are now three principal authorities on Cahokia. James Brown, who's professor emeritus from Northwestern, same age as I am, we've known each other since the early 20s. Thomas Emerson, who until two years ago was for many years, the director of the Illinois Archeological Survey and the uh, principal investigator at the great Cahokia area excavations in the 1970s for the ring road. Uh, the Belt Highway around the American Bottom, FAIA 270. And then more recently, the extensive excavations where a new bridge is being built over the Mississippi uh, on the Illinois side, uh, what is called East St. Louis. Uh, so Emerson has been in charge, has been, has directed the two very 
extensive, almost unprecedentedly large, extended professional excavations uh, almost anywhere in the United States, but certainly for Cahokia. Uh, Emerson has been an excellent director of archaeology. He has insisted that all the archaeological data be properly published soon after the excavations and made readily available to everyone. So I greatly commend Emerson for this. On the other hand, if it isn't in Illinois, he's not interested in it. And finally, Tim Paukatet, who is both professor at the University of Illinois Urbana and now for the last two years, um, director of the Illinois Archaeological Survey um, after Emerson retired. Uh, Palkatet is a very different personality from Emerson. Uh, a, a matter of fact, you can say Palkatet is, is a personality and Emerson is just a good, hardworking guy. So Palkatet has um, led a number of bright students to follow his lead, his research plans, a uh, great deal of it at Cahokia, but also at a site uh, about 12 miles, or is it 12? No, 12 miles uh, east of Cahokia proper up in the uplands, a uh, site he calls the Emerald Acropolis. Well, it, it's a ridge and it's green colored, uh, but I, I don't know, Emerald Acropolis, I expect to see the Wizard of Oz sitting there somewhere. Um, in other words, Palkatet goes in for color. He also, unfortunately, prefers to follow and cite French philosophers who write in the most esoteric Greek and Latin and there are two things in his more recent public. Pocket's early publications are, are okay, no problem. But in the last 10 years, 12 years or so, he's gone in for this French philosophy, not philosophy of science, just esoteric stuff. And two things have really bothered me a great deal about uh, Pocket's publications recently. One, is that he has a paper which he ends by quoting a medieval scholastic monk named Duns Scotus, who back in 1300 in England made up a Latin neologian, Hech City. This thing. He made it one word, so it's a neologian in 1300. And Tim was very impressed by this Latin, and he ended a major paper on Cahokia by saying, the final word about Cahokia, it's that thing. Cahokia is not that thing. And the medieval monk named Duns, the blessed Duns Scotus, is no person to quote about Cahokia. So that uh, bothered me a good deal. The other recent publication is, the latest I've seen, is Cahokia is arguing that the Cahokians are completely different from the people in Eurasia, Europe, Asia, completely different. They were not into economics or trade at Cahokia, he wrote. Instead, they were religious. And I heard him in a radio interview say, Indians are spiritual people. And my reaction to that is, you ain't spent much time with Indian people on the res, have you, Tim? Indians are ordinary human beings like the rest of us, and they certainly were in Cahokia. 
And you want to see spiritual people, why don't you go to an evangelical fundamentalist church? Okay? Some of us here are very spiritual too. So I prefer not to say Cahokia was built out of a uh, excess of spirituality and had nothing to do with trade. Because for one thing, science, where is the evidence, the hard empirical on the ground evidence that Cahokia had nothing to do with trade and that it was built for faith? Where is the on the ground evidence? I'm a scientist, I ground truth. The evidence for trade is abundant and it's reported, especially during the time that Emerson was in charge of the Illinois survey. And evidence for religious faith? No, it's not science. So if you're funded by the Templeton Foundation as, Tem as Palkerton has been with a a, a generous six-figure uh, research grant, then you're looking for religion because that's where your money's coming from. So it really bothers me that Palkatet is publishing that the people who built and lived in Cahokia were not like us. They were totally other. And that's very colonial. I don't buy that. There are people like the rest of us. So those are the three authorities. We're all personal friends for many years. The three men are nice people, but they are not paying attention to the data, the empirical data at Cahokia. And they absolutely will not discuss links between Cahokia and Mexico. They absolutely will not speak about it. On the other hand, uh, I think some of you remember James Griffin, Jimmy Griffin, the director of the Archaeological Museum at University of Michigan. Jimmy Griffin, through a good part of the second half of the 20th century, was the authority in Midwestern archaeology. And Griffin accepted in print that there were unquestionably links between Cahokia and Mexico. So I'll mention those links later. So at any rate, I'll move on um, from this that well, I will mention the uh, Info for me is alicekehoe.com. And the picture you're looking at is 1960, the great Gull Lake Bison Drive, 2,000 years of bison corrals in uh, the Canadian side of the prairie. And uh, you see me on the top and my little Danny. My little Danny is now can join AARP, so um, <clears throat> been a long time. And on the bottom is Jim Mertz, who is a uh, native and went back to live in St. Louis. And for many years, uh, James Mertz was quite active in the St. Louis Archaeological Society um, and very active uh, with that group in making Cahokia a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So I thought I'd put in this uh, picture and we are excavating a very large bison skull that appears to be part of a pile of skulls that historically the skulls of the bison bulls were piled in a corner out of respect for the, those animals. And you might also notice that down in the bottom of the picture is Danny's uh, little Tonka trucks for excavating in and carrying uh, dirt from the back dirt. Well, so let's go on to Cahokia in the real world. So here's a picture of Monk's Mound, of course, looking north. 
uh, towards the interstate. And you notice how close Monk's Mound is to water and in other, uh, and the Mississippi is in the background. Wow. And there's just one of the many lakes and uh, creeks, marshes around uh, the center of Cahokia uh, in the picture. And you also notice a car down on the road in front of Monk's Mound to give you the scale. It's a hundred feet high. So another picture of Cahokia from the Grand Plaza, ground level looking up at the uh, main face of the mound from the Grand Plaza. Down in the lower left, east of Monk's Mound, over where there's a tree in the far part of the upper picture, there is a smaller mound. It ain't small, but it's much smaller than Monk's Mound. In the lower left, you see Monk's Mound in the background, <coughs> smaller mound in the foreground, the plaza, it's called Ramey Field, and uh, when I took this picture, it was being excavated by John Kelly of Washington University. Um, John Kelly is a good scientific guy. Um, he excavates, he reports the data, and he doesn't try to be grand. In the center, looking straight south across the Grand Plaza from the top of Monk's Mound, you see two mounds at the far end of the Grand Plaza. The one that's most clear has a flat top, but just to the right of it, obscured by the trees, is a conical mound. And on the right um, is the close-up of those two mounds at the south end of the plaza, directly across from Monk's Mound. I'll talk more about why I'm pointing it out later. So here we are at uh, William Semager's beautiful painting of Cahokia in his prime, very, <coughs> excuse me, uh, <coughs> <coughs> very formally laid out on rectangular grids. <coughs> Sorry about my cold. Okay. Over on the left in, in the painting is the so-called Woodhenge, which has been uh, interpreted as built to observe the solstice sunrise over Monk's Mound. Well, any place west of Monk's Mound, you can observe the solstice sunrise over that 100 foot mound. On the basis of, of um, Omaha religious knowledge, uh, Omaha are one of the uh, nations speaking Sagan Suan languages, a closely related group of Suan languages. And the Omaha described how a young man was hunting is hunting and going far from the community when he came across an open circle with a huge tree in the center. And the circle was surrounded by great cedar trees. Cedar trees have religious significance. The bark is red and they have a wonderful aroma. And animals of all kinds were coming into the open circle and rubbing against a great tree. And the cedar trees were filled with birds of every kind. And the tree seemed to be burning, but it wasn't consumed. And so the young man knew 
This was a very holy place. And so, of course, the tree is the axis mundi. It burns with fire, but it is never consumed. And every living thing comes to it. Even this young human came to it. And he came back and he left. He went back and he told his father and the other elder men and the priests. And they said, you have seen a very wonderful thing, a, a walk on thing. And that tree is actually the sun. It burns and it is never consumed. And it gives life and light to everyone. And all us animals, we recognize it. This is a wonderful thing. And from that time on, they had a sun dance. So I think that on the left is not a simple solstice observatory, but a giant Cahokian sized sun dance that will be retained by so many of the um, First Nations of North America. You also notice there's a lot of water around Cahokia. You know, it's been drained, it's been channeled. There are reservoirs. It used to be a lot more marshy. Now let's look on the right. This is one of the maps that Thomas Emerson's uh, East St. Louis project developed. The star that says Cahokia is the central part that is now Cahokia State Park. That is what the painting shows. It's not all of Cahokia, it's just this part with the monumental mounds in the grid pattern. And I am drawing your attention to a series of little red dots from the top, <coughs> the top of the floodplain, the north end of the floodplain, going around the curve of the eastern edge of the American bottom floodplain. There's a series of these little red dots. They just keep on going all the way along. Mind you, each of these red dots is an excavated site. There could be many more of them in that line that haven't been excavated. And there, of course, would be many that were destroyed by everything that has happened on the eastern side of St. Louis um, for 200, 300 years. So I am suggesting that that long series, north to south, little homesteads that make a pattern of dispersed homesteads following the east edge of the floodplain of the river are in Etsonoa, that is, a dispersed trading town that is a native type of urban settlement in North America. It is quite different from the Eurasian kinds of what well, uh, one anthropologist called stone cities, walled cities densely, densely occupied, uh, very much like in the top right uh, aerial photo, the present day town, American town, on the Walnut River um, that the satellite shows. So there is one kind of urban settlement which can be called a uh, stone city after Conrad Ehrensberg's uh, classic paper of half a century ago. The other type are the green cities. The Mayan cities are mainly green cities. There are green cities in Southeast Asia, Angor, is a green city. 
a green city has a central uh, section with monumental buildings where the rulers and the high priests live and where trade is centered. And spreading out from the green city center are the farms that support the city. So the farms, the farmsteads are part of the city. There's no sharp boundary. There's no wall around the central part. It's free and open to everyone to walk in and out. And the farms stretch for many kilometers in the direction of that good agricultural lands. So the Native American, North American type of town is the green town with dispersed homesteads uh, with their farms. Now the big difference is that the recent research shows that these dispersed farmstead towns in um, the Midwest, the greater Midwest, have no central place. They have no central plaza. They have no central temple. They have no central palace. Instead, as a trader comes into the town and he will be escorted by soldiers from the checkpoints of access, that's how, the, that's how they are defended. Soldiers are set at checkpoints where the road to the town, the trail to the town, leaves the main long distance uh, route. And at those checkpoints, if somebody turns on to the trail to the town, the soldiers will approach him. And uh, if he seems like a legitimate trader, uh, a man or two will accompany him to the town. And obviously, if he seems like a spy or a scout for their enemies, uh, the men at the checkpoint will call up the reserves that are waiting, and there'll be a battle out there, not at the town. This is uh, unusual. I mean, we think it's unusual, but it worked. And it's historically well documented for the Caddoan speaking peoples in the Southern Plains and East Texas. And this that you're looking at the upper right is in the Caddoan area of central Kansas and it's the work of Donald Blakesley, who is the first to recognize from um, map of 1601 in uh, Spanish colonial records, the dispersed town that ran for five miles along the Walnut River before the river uh, entered the Arkansas itself. And so the map shows the town as described in the 1601 map. And the pink is where Donald Blakesley has actually excavated and confirmed it's just one farmstead after another, after another, after another. Uh, the map of 1601 reported now, it, this was reported by um, Onyate, the head of this Entrada, to the authorities of colonial uh, Mexico. This is a, a government document, really, from 1601. So the accuracy is, is pretty reliable. The uh, Onyate's men counted. They counted. He was very insistent. 2,000 houses. They counted between eight and 12 people in each house. Therefore, the population was about 20,000. And they measured the length of the dispersed town and it was the equivalent of five miles. So this is a new discovery of a new kind of urban settlement. It has since been 
shown. It also was one like it uh, uh, close to Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the Arkansas River Valley. Spyro was probably one in the Arkansas River Valley. And uh, my colleagues here in Wisconsin, David Overstreet, when we discuss this, <coughs> thinks there's one at um, Green Bay, the, the port on Lake Michigan, Green Bay, um, that his knowledge of uh, all the sites in that area, he, he looked at, at uh, Blakesley's work and he said, I definitely think there's such a town at uh, the mouth um, the port uh, of Green Bay. And Dale Henning, uh, who's an authority on the Western part of the Mississippi Valley has already published <coughs> that the site he excavated, <coughs> Blood Run, which was described by French traders in the 1600s, uh, was also <coughs> this kind of a dispersed trading town. <coughs> So it seems to be a native uh, North American kind of town that has not been reported or recognized uh, before Blakesley. <laughs> so I'll just uh, go on. So I want to remind you that Mexico, according to geographers, is in North America. That's what geographers say, look at the map. North America extends down to Central America. And um, according to Google Maps, you can drive, take a 30 mile, 30 hours. <coughs> you can drive from Cahokia, St. Louis, to Cholula, which uh, I interpret uh, as the great market center and power in early post-classic Mexico that the Cahokians we're trading with. It's perfectly feasible to go between the two cities. What is very striking is the history of Cholula and how it matches the history of Cahokia and of Chaco in the Southwest. So Stephen Lexon, who was the authority on Chaco, uh, and I independently, because that was fun, uh, we independently figured out that it was Cholula during the years that both Kohoki and, um, and um, Chaco flourished. Uh, both of them must have been trading into Cholula because the absolute correlation of time between first the occupation of Cholula by the ambitious armies uh, in about 950. And by the time they got their power uh, established in central Mexico and started extending their trading empire out, both Cahokia and Chaco were built. And both Cahokia and Chaco are unique in American North of Mexico. And Cahokia matches in part uh, what you find all over Mexico. Uh, Chaco in that arid valley, you couldn't really build a, a kind of central city uh, that you see in what is now Cahokia State Park, the mounds and the plazas. So, look 
first on the lower center, a view of Teotihuacan. So we're on the pyramid of the moon and we're looking at the pyramid of the sun, one of the largest pyramids in the world. And uh, I use this picture because you can see pretty clearly Pyramid of the Sun replicates the outline of the great mountain in back of it. And that mountain in back of it has um, temples. Uh, and, and we know from the Aztec times that there were major rituals that were held. People walked up in procession to high on that mountain to hold these rituals. Children were sacrificed and so on. So it was quite uh, common in Mexico, not all Mesoamerica, because not every place has mountains, but where there are mountains like these, rimming a valley, for the pyramids to replicate the mountains. In other words, the mountains were brought to the ruler. You know, uh, Muhammad moved the mountain to him. This is as powerful a symbol of the power of the ruler as you can possibly imagine. He had the mountain brought into his city next to his palace. So Teotihuacan is a model. It goes back 2000 years. It is a model for the perfect Mexican city, which the Aztecs in Nahuatl called Tolan. Now Tolan, uh, interestingly enough, the ideal Mexican city since the time 2,000 years ago of Teotihuacan is called the place of reeds and rushes, a marsh. In fact, Teotihuacan Valley was marshy. And of course, the Aztec capital is famous for its great marshes with the chinampas on it. So the ideal Mexican city is built on the edge of a very rich marsh. Over on the left, I have a beautiful photo from uh, the archeologist Daniel Benden, uh, which is actually a picture of Trempolo, which is an outpost, uh, has the shrine on it, uh, outpost of Cahokia. Uh, up the Mississippi from Cahokia in southwest uh, Wisconsin. But what I liked was Danielle's beautiful photo showing the marsh and the mountains, the hills, the, it looks like the great mounds. It looks like Monk's Mound rising from a marsh. Well, okay, it's just the Mississippi Bluff. But I wonder whether the Hokians were canoeing up the Mississippi. And one morning they got up from where they were camping and they looked and this is what they saw. I wonder if they saw the outline of Monk's Mound rising from a marsh because we know that they built a shrine on the edge of terrace uh, on those hills. Now, the interesting thing over on the right is Cholula. I happened to be taking pictures of Cholula as we were traveling away from visiting Chihuahua Hopper. And we were on a bus. It was an excursion from the uh, professional meeting in, in Mexico. Uh, excursion and I was the bus. And I snapped this picture. And as I was snapping, I, I recognized and I thought, I, I hope the the picture shows what I'm seeing. First of all, on the left side of the picture, dark, 
you see the Great Pyramid of Cholula with a Catholic cathedral on the top. Directly in back of the Great Pyramid, you see the holy mountain Popocatépetl, the smoking mountain. And you even can see the, the smoky clouds coming out of the smoking mountain. But what intrigues me is on the right side of the photo, we see, of course, the consort, Popocatepetl, um, ejaculating this smoke, uh, has a consort, a female mountain, Ixtaxiquato. She is, of course, sort of lying on her back, waiting for her lover. And you can see her outline. But if you look in front of her, you see a hill, a gray hill back of trees. And that gray hill replicates the outline of Ixtaxiquato. So the Great Pyramid of Cholula replicates the male holy mountain. And north of it, the Cholulans highly modified the natural hill so that it replicates the female mountain. But it also looks like Monk's Mount. And as both Steve Lexon and I are quite sure that the Chacoans and the Cahokians uh, went down to the great markets of Cholula, they must have seen this. So let's go to the Cahokians themselves. The Osage Nation is laying claim to Greater Cahokia uh, for repatriation under NAGPRA. Yeah, I know. They're not going to get all of St. Louis and all of East St. Louis back. What they've actually done, they've actually bought the last remaining mound in the St. Louis area. They bought it with money. Uh, but nevertheless, they have filed claim. Now, the Osage are one of the five Sagan branch of Suan. Uh, the far western branch of the Suan languages is Lakota. So everybody knows the Sioux, the Lakota out there in North and South Dakota. They're the far western extension. In the Midwest, the Osage, the Omaha, the Ponca, the Kansa, now called Kaw sometimes, and the Quapaw are closely related um, dialects or languages of a branch of the Suan language stock called Zagayan. They're very much aware that they were once one people, maybe a thousand or so years ago. And their own historians say that they were the rulers of Cahokia. Their own historians say that the Osage were apparently dominant, um, and the Osage at any rate called themselves children of the middle waters. The middle waters are where the Missouri, Mississippi, and the Ohio come together, the middle waters of the continent. And the Osage say that they and their um, brothers and sisters were the rulers. Now, early in the 20th century, after the conquest of the Osage, at last, the Osage were uh, dominated trade in the Midwest, well, since the collapse of Cahokia when they retreated to a defensible homeland uh, in Missouri 
but they continued to dominate trade in the Midwest and they controlled the Osage orange trees from which the best bowwood was made. In other words, they controlled the source of the best munitions for the soldiers uh, for the First Nations. They were powerful until the United States Army after the Civil War finally conquered them. After they were finally conquered and, and had to live in Northeastern Oklahoma, their priests were in despair. The people were saying, we lost our power. Those sacred people who had maintained us for all these centuries, they left us, something happened. We're not going to perform the old rituals anymore. And the priests who had performed them were, some of them said, yes, this knowledge will die with us, but others were upset. And there was a young man who was Omaha speaking closely related language, neighbor, who worked for the Smithsonian and he went to the Osage um, reservation and he offered to record in Osage language, the ritual text that the priests uh, knew so that they should not die with the old priest. There are thousands of pages in the Smithsonian, thousands of pages actually published by the Bureau of American Ethnology. And it's a wonderful record of all the ritual knowledge and spiritual knowledge of the Osage nation. And if you read, uh, if you read as much as you can manage to read, <laughs> Uh, bit by bit by bit, and I certainly haven't read all of it, but um, there's a great deal. That matches Cahokia. And I want to uh, particularly mention that one of the ritual uh, texts talks of the great thunderclouds coming together and standing there together. And if you're on the great plaza of Cahokia, you often see the great thunderclouds coming together and standing, and they're standing on the mounds. And the mounds look like they are the great clouds, the great thunderclouds. I mean, it's quite an experience, and it happens quite a lot because there's a lot of thunderstorms where the Gulf Coast air meets the dry air of the Missouri uh, River Valley and causes great thunderstorms. So I think that the great mounds to the Osage may have been like the thunderclouds came and stood. But in addition, something very interesting are two ritual figurines that are very well known. One is called Berger, uh, and these were both made in Cahokia. And uh, she was found outside a temple, close outside a temple, rather on the outskirts of Cahokia, actually, in a village temple. And the other is called Keller, and she was found inside the same temple. So these two female figures are a pair, one of the outside and one of the inside. Berger exactly matches grandmother who never dies, the spirit of all that grows, uh, the mistress of the cornfields. In the winter, the cord maiden spirits come into her great earth lodge, and she takes care of them. And in the spring, when she hears the geese flying north, she opens the door of her earth lodge, and she tells the cord maiden spirits, go to the women's fields, go to the women fields, 
and give them their corn. So here we see this female figurine in the back and front. And on her back, she has the kind of burden basket that women take to the fields. And it, it's rather odd. There are gourds, cultivated gourds like pumpkins, and they are growing into her burden basket. She didn't put them in, they're growing into it. And she is kneeling in the middle of her consort, who is the underwater panther, the double-headed serpent. So you see in the back, you see the two heads of the serpent. In the front, she is either hoeing the serpent with a stone-bladed milk creek shirt, stone-bladed hoe, or else she's scraping his hide with a heavy stone scraper. I, I've never decided which she's doing, but whichever. She is the deity of that which is outside. And she links with the great underwater spirit, the underwater panther. In contrast, Keller has none of this. Keller looks like a human woman. She's kneeling, and if you look, she's kneeling on a folded bear skin. Here are the bear paws of the folded bear skin. She's kneeling, and we don't see her hands and arms very well. Her hand is here, but her arms are broken. People assume she has her hand on some kind of a cane a woven basket or something. I think it may represent a loom. That they couldn't make a full-size loom because the stone block they had to carve in wasn't long enough. They just had a square stone block. I think it may be a loom. And this is the batten that she's using uh, when she's weaving. And what she would have been weaving is the beautiful fine mat in which the war bundle of the priest is wrapped and used in the ritual when the Osage army is going out to battle. The war bundle has a hawk inside, wrapped up inside, along with a pipe. And the mat is wrapped in, uh, is woven to show the path of the sun. And um, what I said, the galaxies in the sky. So it shows the cosmos. It can only be woven by a priestess. She's been ordained as a priestess. And she agrees to weave this when a new war bundle must be made. And as she weaves, according to the text that Will Flesh recorded, as she weaves, she sings a lament. The war bundle is going to be used for war. Some of the Osage men are going to die in that war and she sings a lament as she weaves the wrap for the war bundle. So I think this Keller figurine is singing that lament, that she's weaving the, the mat. And the important thing is that in the ritual procedure, the war priest, sends an official messenger to formally ask her if she will make a new mat to wrap a new war bundle. And he offers her the skin of a female black bear to sit on while she weaves. So here she's sitting on the skin, folded skin of a bear. That's why I think this has to be Keller. 
So I also like to point out that it's very important, these marshes, they're very important because mats woven from marshes are also used as the seat on which a ruler sits in Mexico and the north of Mexico. And these mats woven of marsh uh, plants, rushes, are used for mats wrapping other uh, ritual objects, holy things. And the Osage have many rituals that require either the use of reeds, rushes, uh, or in one, uh, a young child, a baby, is taken by its mother to the nearest marsh. The mother plucks a lotus plant up on the top. She plucks a lotus plant from the marsh and she puts the tuber of the plant in the baby's mouth. And thus she introduces the baby to the life-giving foods that come out of the marsh. Well, that basically is my main presentation. And I'm not showing the 32 file teeth that are the actual link, according to James Griffin. Uh, Griffin in his article, his published article, uh, just before Binford appeared on the scene, I, I should mention uh, James Griffin and Lewis Binford were, were bitter. They hated each other. Um, okay, but uh, before Binford <laughs> left University of Michigan with his degree at last, uh, Griffin published this list of all the evidence that he recognized linking Cochia to Mexico. And he concluded his paper with the file teeth are the strongest evidence because no place else in North America, the people file their teeth. But at the same time, the time of Cahokia, file teeth were all the fashion in Mexico and file teeth are very numerous all through Mesoamerica at that time period. And since there are no other file teeth north of Mexico except at Cahokia, and there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of filed teeth in Mesoamerica at the same time, Griffin thought that was pretty strong evidence. So just to um, conclude, you can see a couple of the murals of Kakashla, where the Cholula's rulers during the time of Cahokia uh, had set up a power base as they were expanding their empire from the East Coast into central Mexico. They conquered Kakashla and they immortalized their battles with these stupendous murals on the left part of the actual fighting. Uh, an unfortunate person uh, is losing his life uh, at the hands of some fearsome warriors. And interestingly enough, on the right is a bird man. Look, it's a bird man. It's a real bird man, but a bird man more magnificent than anybody in Cahokia would ever have seen until they got down to Cholula. From Kakashla, the um, expanding empire of, they're called the Omeka Shikalanka. They have no relation to the very ancient so-called Omecs. Um, the Omeka Shikalanka are um, allied nations from the east coast of Mexico in the uh, post-classic, early post-classic. They expanded from the east coast into central Mexico and once they had a stronghold at Akashla, they marched south to Cholula and conquered Cholula around 950. 
And here's a great pyramid <coughs> of Shalu in the middle. They ruled until 1086 <coughs> when the people they had conquered at Cholula a couple hundred years before, who were actually the Toltecas, the Toltecs, <coughs> uh, were able to reconquer Cholula from the Omeka Shikalanka. And the Omeka Shikalanka had to retreat out of central Mexico and go back to the East Coast. And that was when both Chaco and Cahokia collapsed. And all the small kingdoms around in the Midwest that had been slave raided for their people to be sold in the great market, the great slave market at Cholula, so Featherwork could be bought. Uh, they had their opportunity now. There are no more Mexicans, and they were able to attack Cahokia successfully. And the Zegeansuans retreated up the Missouri River to a defensible area in the state of Missouri. And I'm showing you a couple of birdmen down there below the Kakashla birdmen. Uh, so just for your viewing pleasure. Mm -hmm. So the, to conclude, the exact timing of Chaco and Cahokia with the Omeka Shikalanka conquest of Cholula, the beginning of the North American big trading towns came after the Omeka Shikalanka had established themselves at Cholula around 950. Within less than a century, um, the Omeka Shikalanka had built this long distance trading network in all directions from Cholula, including north. And then they went up to Chaco, in the southwest and straight up the Mississippi to Cahokia. But when their power was broken, both Chaco and Cahokia collapsed. Um, so that is my last slide. Mm -hmm. And I am open for uh, questions. Very interesting, Alice. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for this great presentation. Everyone, please get your questions into the chat feature. You can uh, address it to everyone or to me, whatever you want to do. But back when you were showing the slides um, of Cholula <clears throat> from a distance across the marsh, it was really interesting that both sites, Cahokia and Cholula, have have so much marshes around them. And the fact that weaving reeds, um, <clears throat> that was that was what the royalty would would sit on and, and on top of their you know thrones or, yeah. Yeah. or whatever, they would always have weaved mats. Um, so that was really interesting to me. But besides yeah. the uh, Pachuca obsidian, mm -hmm. um, was there any, has there been found any ceramic vessels like maybe with cacao residue or or yeah anything? okay yeah first of all let me put it this way no Pachuca green obsidian has been recognized at Cahokia. Alex Barker has not looked at everything ever recovered from Cahokia. And since Jim Brown didn't think it was significant, because there's only one, well, now there are seven in Kansas on the Arkansas River Valley in Kansas, uh, because Blakesley recognizes it. But might be there, but never acknowledged as significance. I mean, 
I would hope Jim Brown has seen Green Obsidian from Mexico. Maybe he hasn't walked and tail off to Rockcom like you and I have. I said, oh my gosh, look at all the Green Obsidian right here. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, about the uh, cacao, uh, cups with cacao have been um, identified at Chaco. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the cacao residue inside the cup was uh, chemically uh, tested, and it is cacao. Mm -hmm. The same person whose chemist husband tested the Chaco uh, cup had her husband test a cup from uh, Cahokia that looked like it had the same residue. Hmm. And she and her husband uh, reported that they had found cacao in a cup of Cahokia. However, I discussed this with a Mesoamerican archeologist who teaches at uh, Michigan State, Helen uh, Pollard, an excellent archeologist. And she, she works in West Mexico, Helen does, and she is very familiar with testing for cahokia, uh, sorry, for cacao inside cups. She says that the chemist's husband who identified the cacao at Chaco was not knowledgeable of how easily chocolate molecules uh, float around in America. That Helen's chemist has a sealed lab and no one can come into that lab <laughs> if they have been anywhere as near any form of chocolate during the past month, he's extremely strict about that. So Ellen thinks that it's not likely that it actually was cacao at Cahokia, but apparently it's strong enough at Chaco. Um, it seems like what was inside the cup at Cahokia was probably the black drink. Oh, yeah. And that Berger artifact, um, it certainly had a very Mayan nose. I mean, my gosh. And the fact that it was on a double-headed serpent, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, very Mexican. Is that ceramic or is that red? It's, it's red that red stone that's red called stone. flint clay. Yeah. That is mined outside Cahokia, no, it's something like 60 miles away. It's, you know, it's, make it's, their pipes out of, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's not the pipestone from Pipestone Quarry in southern Minnesota. It's a different stone, but it was much used. Almost all those beautiful red figurines that are called Mississippian are mm -hmm. made of that uh, flint clay from near Cahokia, and they were probably all made in Cahokia. And and trade it, trade it in all directions. Now the and next one. Um, Baker says that after reading so many books and research yeah. papers during the uh, pandemic, yeah, the Upper Classic era and some contact with Cholula are a reasonable explanation for the Big Bang that happened in the American bottoms. Right. The difference between me and Pakistan is he's says all of us, he's talking about a religious cult uh, where all of a sudden a prophet arises and everybody rushes and, and runs to build these immense mounds and plazas and everything out of religious fervor for this religious cult. And I would actually like to ask him, show me a real historic instance 
uh, a cult arising like that, all of a sudden and everybody building like that, Rome was not built in a day. What happened with Christianity? It took centuries before Christianity had cult centers, uh, elemental sites. The same with Islam. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see historic examples because the method of historical sciences is documented ethnographically or historically. Document what appears to have resulted in the same end. But it, the process is known ethnographically. You see people doing it, or historically it's been documented. So I like to see the documentation just for that. But at any rate, yeah. Uh, the next one. Yeah, man, uh, asking, did they speak all of the, yeah. uh, the Hingan language branches? The Osage and the Ponca would say yes. Um, the Ponca are the like official traditional historians. Uh, I mean, they have the office of carrying on the history of those nations. Uh, but the other, uh, again, speaking nations know it too. And um, I think they all recognize that they were once one community and that they were there at Cahokia. Now, whether the Osage were um, like the directors of government and maybe the Quapaw were more farmers, you know, we don't know, but they recognize equality among each other and that they have this common ancestry. And then Baker makes a few comments. He uh, he also noticed the similarities of the Birdman and the yeah. Um and but he says Cholula will reach its maximum after the fall of Cahokia and still exists to this day. This is very important because what I didn't go into was Cholula remains a great pilgrimage center. And during the annual pilgrimage of 100,000 people, it has a great trade fair. Mm. A lot of what draws the people uh, is not to go to the cathedral on top of the pyramid, but to either sell or buy at the trade fair that surrounds the great pyramid. Mm. Oh. Which is more important? Well, actually, John Pohl, P-O-H-L, who's an excellent Mesoamerican archaeologist and also pays attention to the history, uh, has written about the pilgrimage to Cholula, and he emphasizes how important the trade fair is also. Mm -hmm. um, so after Cholula's Invaders, the Omeka Shikalaka invaded from the east and uh, drove the Toltecas down, really, more than out down. Uh, they still kept some priests on the Great Pyramid, Tolteca priests on the Great Pyramid. Uh, but uh, the Toltecas sent According to their history, they sent two of their high priests from the Great Pyramid, which is called the Water Mountain. Well, water, Mount Water is very important. Uh, so they sent two priests who walked northwest, and there's two wonderful maps showing them walking along and meeting all kinds of monsters and different people and all kinds of things. And they finally reached the Northwest, the Chichimecas, the wandering dog people, uh, hunter-gatherers. Uh, the uh, Chichimecas dress in animal hides. They look like cavemen in these pre-conquest uh, paintings. And they carry longbows as big as they are. And the Tolteca 
priests beg them to come with, with all their bowmen and they will attack the, the foreigners who have taken over to Lula. So they all march back. The uh, spirit up in the seven caves where the Chichi Mecca originate uh, uh, allowed them to leave the seven caves and march back. And with that, it, it, it's like, you know, the, um, the medieval war between France and, and, and England. And the English bowmen with their great U bows uh, gave them victory. And so the Chichimeca bowmen uh, were able to reconquer Cholula. And uh, the Toltecas, with, they had to make the Chichimec leaders nobles and give them estates. This is why we have all the documentation because all of the nobles had to document their estates to the Spanish uh, colonial power. So they gave all these histories. And uh, the, whole, the whole thing about paying attention to Cholula is, is quite significant. Yeah. Baker says his feeling is that uh, Cholula was the inspiration for a Mississippian version of Cholula. Now, in regard to Mike Smith, and I thank you very much, Mike, for listening. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, there is there's a real problem with saying Omeka Chikalaka, but Mike, what else are we going to call them? I mean, I can't find any other uh, name for, for this, uh, this uh, nation that we have the history, we know they were at Kikasa. I, I, I can't find any name that all of you Mesoamericanists agree on. Well, so, do, we, do we need to have a, an ethnic name? They were the you know, post-classic peoples of Cholula. Yeah, but we, well. But it, anyway. I mean, you know, I, I mean, yeah, the, the basic thing is the Aztec history the Sagun recorded is Aztec propaganda. Yeah. The whole thing is most blatant propaganda. I mean, it's kind of disgusting. But, uh, Mike, if you come up with a name that I can use, I will be so happy <laughs> to do so. Uh, what I'm basing, what I'm particularly uh, basing this last part on is Andrew Turner's dissertation of 2016. Um, on uh, Kakashla and um, and this I'll make a Shikalaka, whatever you want to call them, uh, expansion. I found a, a great deal of, of value in Andrew Turner's dissertation. I'm, I'm just very skeptical for a lot of these ethnic interpretations from the Aztec myths and uh, I've published on this and a lot of my Mesoamericanist colleagues are really annoyed with me for, for this. <laughs> But another, one more thing, I enjoyed your talk very much. And uh, my archaeological field school was at the site where the Berger figurine was found, the BBB Motors site with Chuck Barris in the 1970s. Now, we didn't find that figurine. We did a bunch of test pits and found nothing. Yeah. But then when they stripped the plow zone off with the continuing project, they found that figurine. <laughs> yeah. You know, Tom Emerson himself personally excavated that. Uh. Tom Emerson excavated the BBB motorcycle. Well, our, our field school was a good lesson in why random sampling doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> we did random sampling of test bits and found nothing at all. And then they stripped the plow zone off and found a whole village. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Alan. Uh, the question about was there anything in Mexico found from Cokia? I mean, you ask the Mexican archaeologists to recognize anything from Anglo-America. They're not familiar. They're certainly not looking for it. If north of the border, so many American archaeologists can't recognize Pachuca Green Obsidian, what do you expect the Mexican archaeologists? 
And one of the angles is six out of the 32 file teeth were finally analyzed for isotopes just a few years ago. Uh, it's Kristen Hedman. Uh, and four of the six, the isotopes showed they were from the Midwest. Two of the six, one third of the sample, they could not match with any isotope that the lab at University, Indiana University had on file. I talked to Kristen Headman just last week. There was a four hour presentation on Cahokia last week at Society of American Archaeology meeting. I know everything that's the latest on Cahokia. Um, Kristen was there. I said, why did you not send those two isotopes uh, for consultation with uh, Ina in Mexico, the Instituto Nacional de Archeología. And she just looked at me and she said, well, um, uh, yeah, well, we didn't. Well, I mean, to me, that seems so obvious. Uh, let's see, uh, obsidian trade, yeah, it's uh, fascinating because all obsidian can be sourced to the quarries if you can find the quarries. Uh, somebody's asking about adobe brick. The pyramid at Cholula, the inside of it, is it, it, this astounding adobe, incredible billions of adobe bricks. Uh, Cahokia was made out of local soils. Um, and the soil built mounds were topped with colored clays. And this was discovered by Robert Hall and argued for years and everybody laughed at him until enough people were showing the colored slides of their excavations. That was 1998, I remember it very well. And all of the great mounds in this, what I'm calling the Tolan part of Cahokia uh, were topped with obviously uh, significant colors of of different soils. So um, let's see. The uh, canoe load, yes, yes. Hopewell, not only did Hopewell have obsidian from Yellowstone, and I did incidentally mention that the dispersed towns along river terraces would be a explanation for how Hopewell people lived. They lived in this native kind of dispersed towns that would go on for miles that looked like a series of farmsteads. And they could have built those extraordinary geometric earthworks um, because the people were all living there, but they were dispersed. Um, well, somebody thinks Cholula was the inspiration. I mean, I'm sure go with that. But the, the problem with Anglo-America, Cholula is the only place that has the grid system, rectangular plazas with rectangular mounds surrounding it. Hopewell does not have these plazas. Um, places like Etowa, Akmulgi, um, you know, those Eastern uh, mound centers. You go there and you kind of have this feeling, oh, well, they tried, but oh, so pinny compared to Kogia. You don't have the great rectangular plaza. You don't have it lined with those great rectangular mounds. But Mexico, rectangular plazas, rectangular mounds, grid system. It's a big difference. Um, look, yeah. look at oh, Steve uh, Lexon's question right at the end. Um, yeah, right. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, Jimmy Griffin was interested in everything that was reasonable data in the United States. He was very open-minded. He often didn't talk, 
about his ideas, but I had the privilege of uh, being a secret friend of his. I don't want to go into the detail. Uh, we didn't have any relationship, but um, he told me that he agreed with me that there was no connection between woodland ceramics in Northeast North America and ceramics uh, further south. Uh, but he didn't want to start arguing about it. He actually took me in a corner of a room where no one else could hear it and, and told me this. And then after that, <laughs> he would smile and, and we go in the corner and he'd tell me something or other that was interesting. So yeah, he was, he was open to the obvious idea that, that there was no border wall back then and why should there not be relationship? And he wrote that paper and published it in science as a definitive uh, paper on the issue. Um, the Southeast archaeologist mucked around in the Northern Huasteca. Are you thinking of uh, Scotty McNish, Richard McNish in uh, Tamaulipas? Or are you thinking about um, Diana Zaragoza and Patricio Davila, her husband? They were they're Mexican archaeologists, so they worked for enough for many years. I think you may be thinking of Tantoc, where uh, Zaragoza and Davila excavated for several years until the landowner told them he'd had enough of them messing around in his fields and uh, get off. Uh, I don't care about your archaeology. Uh, I'm, I'm close friends with uh, the couple, and I have been to Tantoc. I wanted to see Tantoc myself. The, this Mexican couple found a number of head pots that look just like the head pots from Arkansas in the Huasteca, in museums in the Huasteca. They didn't uncover anything themselves, but in museums in Huasteca. And they found at least a dozen that seemed to be well promised to having actually come from the Huasteca. And they, not being so familiar with Mississippian, thought that Tantoc, with its plazas and mounds, might be a variant of Mississippian. In the same time period. But I have, I'm familiar with a number of Mississippian mound centers, and I have been to Ten Talk in 2012, within a couple of days, and it, it is absolutely not Mississippian. Its mounds are built with a large rectangular mound, earthen mound, and on top of that, is built a conical earthen structure that has a bunch of plazas, but the plazas are not the grid system. The, I mean, it, Tantoc is quite different from central Mexico. Um, Tantoc is not a Tolan, uh, but it's also definitely not Mississippian. And it didn't have Mississippi, it didn't have any Mississippian artifacts in the excavations that uh, Saragossa and, and Dalva did. Um, Steve Lexon, uh, uh -huh. who mentioned James Griffin, he's unmuted himself and he'd like to <clears throat> ask you a question. Go ahead, Steve. Well, thank you. Um, great talk, Alice. I missed the first 20 minutes. My question is, there was interest from Jimmy Griffin and some other people. There are folks that did surveys down in the West Teca, you know, some Southeast archaeologists in the 30s, and I can't remember who. I mean, I know about Tam Talk, but that's much later. Yeah. Okay, so there was interest back in the 30s and the 40s. Yeah. And now there's none. What happened? Did somebody get up at a meeting and say, you know, you're all going to go to hell if you, if you, you know, mention Mesoamerica? I mean, uh, something happened. There was some shift there that happened. And, and I've been wondering all my, you know, all my career, what happened? Well, yeah, uh, my, my feeling, my guess is Philip Phillips. 
Okay. Phillips was absolutely determined to prove there was no connection whatsoever. He was extremely wealthy. And he paid for uh, a team of two women to spend three years going around to every single museum that had engraved conch shells, um, you know, famous from Spyro, mm -hmm. and make photographs, cast um, notes on it. And then he published this five volume opus on a prehistoric uh, shell engravings from Spyro. And he paid Jim Brown to write up the history of excavations because Phillips being so wealthy, wasn't going to do any of that, you know, grunt work. You know, he paid Jim Brown, who was enormously grateful. And Phillips, who had no training in art history, neither did Jim Brown, no training in art history. Uh, Phillips had thought he might study architecture, but he didn't follow up. He decided on the Braden and, and Craig styles. He created them. Um, it's not well-founded. Uh, if you were an art historian, it doesn't follow. I mean, I've talked with art historians. It doesn't, the Craig and, and Braden styles do not follow the way an art historian would um, analyze uh, styles. But Phillips, was at Harvard, he was absolutely determined. Uh, he had this big project, uh, this mo marvelous conch shell engravings project. Mm -hmm. And if you read the first volume of the uh, Phillips and Brown, uh, the the less expensive paperback version for its volume, there's a footnote in which he says he took one of the engraved conch shells to the World Authority on Mollocks at Harvard. And he asked him where this kind of a conch would have come from. And the World Authority at Harvard told him from the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic coast uh, off South Florida, probably Gulf of Mexico. So that means someone was in the shore of the Gulf of Mexico harvesting uh, these conchs and took the shell all the way up the Arkansas River to Oklahoma and left it at Spyro. A Mexican. I mean, you think Trump is bad? Phillips <laughs> was absolutely raving of the mouth. So he says in this footnote, well, this Harvard expert on Molex obviously doesn't really know. He would not accept the authority of what he says in the footnote was the world authority. So I think it was Philip and uh, the influence he had at mid-century that discouraged everybody. And then there was a whole bunch of other things. I mean, Clyde Cluckham was involved with Walt Taylor, and so we won't talk about that here. Oh. Yeah. And also, Scotty McNish got the job at the National Museum of Canada and went up into the Boreal Forest. So that was part of it, too. Great, thank, thank you very much, Alice. I, I hadn't thought of Philip Phillips. I have the cheap edition of Spyro. I will go look at it right now, but thank you. And the one about Osage Orange, I really wonder about that, but I mean, I'm sort of guessing in the first place, Bowood would not be preserved. I mean, it might be in some places, and uh, but it would be very unusual to have it preserved. Um, what is but the interesting thing about Osage Orange is the trees grow in a very limited area in the southern plains. It's very limited environment, and that's how the Osage were able to control it. Is it a tree that has a fruit, or what is Osage Orange?
Did you hear my question? Did you? <laughs> what, uh, Alice, what is Osage Orange? Okay. What is Osage Orange? Oh, okay. Osage Orange is a tree, not a not a very big tree. Um, it's called a tree, and it grows in this limited environment in the southern plains. Uh, I. Can't remember exactly. It's <laughs> Oklahoma, Arkansas area. I can't remember precisely at this moment exactly, but you, you can Google. You can Google Osage orange trees. Uh, where do they grow? And, and you'll find out. And pearl is added. It's that like you would. It's like the you would in uh, Europe in England. It's. Uh, has great strength and also the resiliency so that, you know, the energetics of uh, pulling the bow, the wood doesn't break, but it, um, and you can make these long bows. And when you, when a long bow archer uh, pulls that long bow, uh, the arrow is very, very powerful. Hmm. Yeah, people are chiming in. Uh, Pearl says it's it has a green fruit that almost looks like a grapefruit. And as a kid, we yeah. called them Martian brains. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And uh, Kim and Mary Lee are saying it grows in Illinois. It is very durable and used for pence posts that could last mm -hmm. over 100 years. Yeah. And it's also caused, called the hedge apple in Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Martian brains. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's a great one. Uh -huh. Does anybody have any other questions for Alice? Alice, can you mention your memoir, The Girl Archaeologist? Uh, well, I, I was thinking you might mention it, Jim. Uh, <laughs> I do um, suggest that people uh, can go to my, uh, my website. It's down the bottom of, of this slide. It's very simple, alicekehoe.com, one word, alicekehoe.com. And actually, um, my dear little Danny, uh, who is now a computer programmer of uh, middle age, uh, set up my website for me, um, Daniel, uh, as we now call him, um, actually teaches uh, constructing websites. So uh, a few years ago, I asked that it's time to do something for mom. And will you please make a website? So when my book is published, people can find it in other other books as well. If you go to alicekehoe.com, you get all the information. And it's a beautiful website, my dear son, after he grew out of Tonka trucks. But can you tell us a little bit about the book? I mean, uh, you're... Uh... Oh, I'm happy to tell you if you're willing to uh, listen. Yes. Okay. Um, I could show the cover. Um, if I can move stuff over my screen. Um, wait a minute. I think... I can get this. Okay. All right, there we are. This is the cover and that's me uh, when I was 30 years old and I am digging Francois House, a early fur trade post, 1768 to 73 in eastern Saskatchewan. 
just uh, above the Saskatchewan River. And this, uh, yeah, it looks like sort of a stage photo. It was our, uh, it was my project. It was actually my project. Um, it was financed as part of a reservoir salvage project, and we had to turn in a annual report to the Saskatchewan Power Corporation that um, financed the salvage. And my husband took this photo showing the Saskatchewan Power Corporation authorities how we worked on this project. So I mean, my husband was provincial archaeologist at the time, and he hired me to excavate Francois House. And uh, I was going to call it girl archaeologist in a man's profession. And then the editor at University of Nebraska Press said, it's a lot about sisterhood here. Let's put that in. I said, well, okay. So I said to him, um, it's more like siblinghood. I mean, you know, like, guys like Steve Lexon and Mike Smith, you know, I mean, it's not just sisterhood. And so I said, yeah. And then when it got to the marketing people, they said, sexist profession. We got a sex in there to sell the book. <laughs> and you can order it from University of Nebraska Press at a discount. Yeah. Oh, this one doesn't show the discount. I think I got it. Okay. Um, For any of you with the uh, last issue of the Aslander, it the link is there with the discount code. Yeah. Oh, here it is with the discount. Get that to open. All right. Mm. Wait a minute, we'll get there. In bright red, you get 40% off, which is almost half price. <coughs> so University of Nebraska Press. That's Nebraska Press, UNL.E. Nebraska Press.UNL.EDU. And use the code 6AS21, and you get half price almost off <coughs> $25. And they are shipping now. Well, great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um... That looks like there's no more questions. So um, everyone, thanks for attending tonight and hanging out this late. Um, we we have one person in the waiting room, but he's entering way too late. I, it, uh, I'm not going to let him enter. But I'll go ahead and stop the recording. And Alice, it's it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for putting this all together for us. And putting Cahokia on the map. <laughs> as well the, as, uh, in the map of trade routes. <laughs> you know, and um, uh, I can't, I, I, I talked to Tim Pocket. I've known him since he was a grad student in 1990. He was actually a close friend of Alex Barker who introduced us in fact. And uh, mm -hmm. I know, I'd like to kind of mention Alex Barker is the past president 2017-19 of the American Anthropological Association. I'm kind of proud of my market students, even if I never had grad students. So at any rate, um, <coughs> I would like to seriously talk with him. I would like to seriously talk with his students. I have talked with three of his women students and they are open to talking but they are still young in their careers they don't have prestigious university research support 
Um, they're not going to ever say that uh, they are persuaded by me and rejecting Tim. I mean, I don't expect them to. It would be very stupid of them. But uh, some of them are, uh, you know, I really consider them junior colleagues. and We've had good conversations. Even uh, last week at SAA in the mammoth uh, um, session. And one of the things that came up um, is the, uh, Tim showed slides of these circular structures that he calls sweat lodges. And I did ask him afterwards about them. He's making a big deal about all these spiritual people were taking, uh, going to sweat lodge, sweat lodge ritual all the time. And so they had all these circular, small uh, structures in Cahokia. And, you know, in East St. Louis, part of Cahokia as well. So he showed slides. First time I saw color photographs of the excavation of one of these circular small buildings. The floor is perfectly clean, light brown, sandy color. There is no reddening from fire or heat anywhere. And there's nothing structure in the floor. It's just a flat, sandy looking floor. So I asked him where the fire was. Now he did show in his presentation an Osage man showing him, him a sweat lodge outside this man's house. And it's your typical sweat lodge. It's basically a rough wigwam on which you pile hides or blankets. And yes, as Tim informed me as if I'd never seen any, uh, the fire is outside and the hot rocks are brought in. I know, uh, Tim, I've been on a reservation. Well, I've seen a lot of squid watch. I haven't been in one because Blackfoot uh, say women do not go in sweat lodges. Women are blessed with the power to reproduce life. Men are not. That's why men have to sweat. Women menstruate as part of their power to reproduce life. So I'm not going in one of those things. I've, I've done it. The reproduction part. So the sweat lodge picture that Tim showed, you clearly saw the pit in the middle of the sweat lodge where the hot rocks are put. And you could see where there's a little fire close to the entrance to the sweat lodge where the fire heats the rocks. Now you carry the rocks into the lodge with a pair of forked sticks. So the fire has to be fairly close to the sweat lodge entrance that with a pair of hot sticks, you are carrying a very hot rock to put it into the pit in the middle. There is nothing of this in the slide of the circular buildings that Tim showed. So I don't buy them as sweat lodges. They may have been storage houses, granaries. I don't know, but I, I won't buy them as sweat lodges. Um, there's one guy, the Glenn Baker, <clears throat> if you look, or I'll send it to you, Alice, but he, he gave his email address and he'd like to contact you. I welcome email from everybody. I answer everybody's email. Um, I really enjoy it. And, and you know, I, I find out most ex exciting and, and, and unexpected things. Um, you know, there's a, a woman with, um, well, shall I say, um, she sees things in fractured stone that I don't see. But she got my memoir and she started posting on all her social media. And she even got a reply quickly that one of her media followers said, I'm buying that book, Sexist. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess marketing people were right. But I've, I've gotten 
other emails, you know, out of the blue. And, and one of the, that I most treasure, um, I published a book on the Kensington runestone in which I gathered all the data and there's no question of the authenticity of the room inscription on the Kensington runestone in Minnesota. And the smoking gun is what was happening historically in Scandinavia in 1360-61. And the date on the stone is 1362. Everything fits. If you read medieval Scandinavian history, it just jumps out at you. And I have tried to confront the naysayers like uh, William Fitzhugh at the Smithsonian sends out this form letter, it is a hoax. And I was at a conference with him a few years ago and I said, okay, Bill, what in my book has failed to convince you? Why do you say it's a hoax? What about the linguistics? What about the history? And Fitzhugh, curator of archaeology at Smithsonian, it's my tax money. He says, I only read archaeology, I don't read linguistics, and I don't read history. Well, you know, I felt like saying, you're a sham, you're a fraud. You're not doing historical science. Get out of my sight. Well, I didn't. But that's the kind of attitude. So, okay, so this book is out, published by Bible and Press. Uh, and it's basically written as an undergraduate text in critical thinking. Waveland has published several little books of mine uh, under critical thinking. And one of them is also Traveling Prehistoric Seas, which I've been giving five lectures on this last two months. It's a very popular topic once uh, Archaeological Institute of America put it up uh, as a possible topic, people grabbed it. I think Jim Reed, didn't you, you see that? Yeah, you saw that one. Um, right. At any rate, I got an email after the Runestone book came out in 2005. And the email said, my wife and I were traveling, visiting relatives in Northwest Minnesota. And we stopped at the Runestone Museum in Alexandria and we bought your book. And we were very impressed with the science. We agreed it really is excellent science. I thought, well, this is nice, but who is this person? David Wake. Oh, he has a University of California Berkeley email. So I Googled David Wake, UC Berkeley. And it's like, oh, my God. He's a distinguished professor of evolutionary biology at Berkeley. And his wife, Marvely Wake, is the department chair of evolutionary biology at UC Berkeley. And both of them are very distinguished scientists. And I mean, it's, I just answered this nice email. So anybody wants to tell me I'm not a good scientist, I say, uh, you might ask these professors at Berkeley. And I actually, um, when I was in San Francisco a couple of times, um, actually my son Daniel was living there for a while. I actually went to Berkeley and I had a couple of wonderful uh, afternoons talking with uh, David Wake and uh, and more briefly with Marvely Wake. So I mean, I I, I love to answer emails, uh, even if you're not a distinguished scientist uh, uh, praising me. Well, all right, Alice. Thank <laughs> for a, a great presentation. And now. Uh, <clears throat> Just for everyone, I'll, I'll, I'll post the link to the recording in next month's At Slander. Uh, share it with your friends and be sure to get a copy of Girl Archaeologist. <laughs> <laughs> yes.
All right, I'll I'll shut up the recording now. So thanks once again. Thank you, Jim, for organizing this. Thank you, Michael, Steve, for uh, chiming in. And um, actually, uh, I'll I'll email um, you to uh, a little technical thing that comes to mind. But uh, I guess we shall leave this now. Alrighty. Okay, thanks once again. Adios. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> and especially thank you, Jim. All righty. To subscribe to the Atslander for free, contact your host, Jim Reed, at mayaman at bellsouth.net. Thanks for joining in tonight. <laughs>